Welcome to the Kingo Podcast, where we interview published authors, screenwriters, and story consultants to answer the question, what makes a great story? If you're enjoying the show, please be sure to subscribe and leave a positive review so that we can continue to grow and learn more storytelling tips from our special guests. In the second half of today's episode, we opened up the podcast to a little bit of Q&A and took some questions related to the business side of the industry. Let's start today's show. So Shannon E. Johnson is a former executive of development and programming at the Sci-Fi Channel. It was there that she honed her skill to guide writers from pitch to production on Alphas, Being Human, Haven, Sanctuary, and Warehouse 13. Now, through her development and script consulting company, The Professional Pen, Shannon helps emerging and professional writers overcome creative roadblocks, craft pitches, and get their writing production ready. She also teaches online screenwriting courses and hosts face-to-face writing workshops around the country. So thank you so much for being here, Shannon. Thank you for having me. I'm excited. I'm excited too. That's quite the resume. So I want to jump into getting some of your story wisdom uh, with the first big question, a general broad question, but I'm I'm curious to hear what you have to say. What makes a compelling story? Awesome. Isn't that what everybody wants to know? It's the secret. It's the secret, right? Well, I think that it's pretty simple. I think a compelling story comes from three-dimensional characters who have an attainable, tangible, and intangible goal, which is heightened by stakes. It's that simple for me. I try to look at writing like math, even though I was never good at it. <laughs> Let me not say that. I was good at math. It just took a lot more effort <laughs> than it did in my English language arts. So let me just say that. But I try to look at it like a math pot, you know, a a math um, equation. If you have your three-dimensional characters that are relatable or likable, because it's 2019, you don't have to like them, but they do have to be relatable. Um, If you have shown me who they are fully as people, and then you give them something that they can actually attain, because you've shown me who they are, so I know what their skill sets may or may not be. So I know that they can attain this thing, I know that there's something on the inside they're trying to fulfill, and you've made that thing, you personified it into something tangible that they can actually grasp or we can actually see them get to their win. And then if you've shown me what they're going to lose or gain over the process, then now I get a chance to lose or gain with them. And to me, that is like the key to making your story compelling. That's excellent. So you mentioned an external goal and an internal goal. And I think a lot of us are familiar with the idea of the external goal over the course of the story, but can you speak to a little more about the differences? Yeah. So for me, the internal goal is the need. And so that's one of the reasons why I try to call it tangible and intangible. Like that intangible thing is like the Wizard of Oz and the the lion needing courage. But what does courage look like? How do we know when he's gotten courage, right? So that means if courage is what he needs, there has to be a goal that he can reach so that he knows I now have courage. The same thing is true for us in the audience. We know he needs courage, but there has to be something set up so that we know when he's achieved it. So him actually getting Dorothy to go see the wizard, actually taking her along the journey and getting there and fighting the bad guys and dealing with the scary stuff, he knows that because I've reached this goal, I now have courage. So we can't just work on just the inside, on just the me, on just the internal. That internal thing is always personified by something external. That's excellent. And, and you mentioned also that characters, you have to make your character either relatable or likable. I know that's, that's about getting closer to that character. Are there any more tips or tricks you would have for creating 3D characters? Yeah, you know, one thing that I tell people is when you're making up your characters, right, when they first get into your head, um, what are the stereotypes that come directly to your mind and then flip them on their head? Right, because at this point in 2019, you've seen any and every character that can ever be made, right? So that means we all have expectations of what a stereotypical uh, boss woman looks like, or what a stereotypical athlete looks like, what a stereotypical 
gangster looks like, right? So what happens if you take that and turn it on its head? The other thing that I tell people is how people present themselves and who they really are are, are almost never the same thing. It's your job to show me how other people view your character and how your character views his, him or herself and then what's possibly the truth. <laughs> you know, like what's that, that middle gray area that most of us will never know, right? Even those of us who have spouses, you're, you're trying to figure out like, what's that middle area, like who you actually are, what I see and what you think, and where do you find that middle? So you're kind of trying to give me enough information so I can understand why they make the decisions that they make. I think a lot of the times when we're writing our stories, we're making them make decisions that need to be made so that they can attain their goal versus what decision would this character make? Because the Hulk and Thor and Black Widow all have the same goal, but they're going to go about it three different ways because they're three different people with three different traumas, right? Three different lives, three different things that, that make them tick. So if you think about your character as full people, then you can understand why they do the things we do. So again, going back to them being likable versus relatable, if you think about... Um, Heath Ledger's Joker. He's very relatable. Of course, we don't like him because he's the bad guy, but he's so relatable that now we understand why he's the bad guy. Now he's not just, oh, you're the bad, bad versus evil kind of thing. It's like, no, there's a middle. If we think about Black Panther and Killmonger, Killmonger is the bad guy. He's got some pretty decent ideas, right? Like he, he, he wants to do good. It's just how he does it that makes it bad, right? But his ideas and who he, who he is because we got to see his backstory. We know that something was taken from him and then he was put into this life and, and missed out on Wakanda, right? But he's upset because I know that I can understand why he makes the decisions that he makes. So that's what I mean by making them three-dimensional, making them full people. Because if I understand who they are, then I'm going to go with the decisions that they make versus not going with it and they're not being invested. Mm. And so I'm picking up on a, a theme in what you're saying, sort of a dichotomy in the character, maybe between their public versus private or perception versus reality or expected versus unexpected. Exactly. And I think I always try to tell my clients to just think about real people. And I know that sounds cliche, but just think about real people that you know. Think about yourself. Think about your parents. Think about your sisters, your spouses, your, your whoever. We all know that we present one thing because that's what we feel like the world needs to see, whether it's because we think we're going to be judged <laughs> or because we have been judged. So we're trying to you know, show this other thing or because of what society says something is supposed to be. There are a lot like think about, um, you know, uh, uh, when we finally got not Nancy Kerrigan, but what was the other woman's name who had the, the film? <laughs> Tanya, right? When we finally got Tanya Harding's side of the story. That's right. She's ice skating. And in ice skating, you're supposed to be this prim and pulled up person, right? So she never did that, which is why she was always ostracized and always on the outside. So then let's just think about all of these other skaters who did do that. Is that who they were at home? <laughs> you know, we don't know. But every time they came out, they presented themselves as this prim and proper person. What's going to make them interesting is the fact that they aren't. It's totally uninteresting to see somebody play one note, right? So if someone's prim and proper at all times and there's never anything other than that, I don't wanna watch that character. Not the main character anyway, you know? I don't wanna watch them go through a journey. It can definitely be one of the sub-characters whose point is to play one note, <laughs> you know what I mean? But as far as the people who I'm supposed to be journeying with, They've got to be real people. They have to be flawed people. Yeah, I love that. I think that that's so spot on with having someone who appears one way under certain circumstances and is something else under others. And that really creates that interest in the character. So, yeah, but, so another question, whether on a broad level or on a dramatic scene level, how do we keep the audience interested? It's a big question. I think what we have to... Some people disagree with me. Some people think that you should be writing for the audience, right? I don't necessarily disagree with that, but I do think that everything has an audience. 
right? So if you realize everything has an audience, that means that there's somebody out there who will go on this journey with you. There's somebody who's willing to go. So keeping them interested is going back to not playing that one note. Keeping them interested is having complications that happen along the way that change what the expectations are that have already been set. We kind of talked about uh, earlier, as people who've been watching movies for the last 100 years now, we kind of have an expectation when we go in the theater. So you keep us interested when you shatter that expectation, when you do something different with your characters, when you make them face something that we didn't think that they were going to face. Or for me, I love it when characters fail and it actually affects them and the story. I love it when the good guy doesn't win because that's life. I love it when the main character dies because it's like, I was one of those people who used to watch movies all the time when I was younger, like, why is the good guy so great at what they do and the bad guy is so terrible? Like, the good guy can come in here and beat up 15 people, <laughs> right? But the bad guy can't shoot the good guy? He's, the shot always misses? <laughs> you know what I mean? So I love it when someone says, no, the bad guy is just as great and the good guy can be wounded, right? So if you think about Creed 2, so I already saw this coming because if, if you're going to have this boxing match a quarter or less than, a ha less than halfway through the film, then he's got to lose can't win because then what is the rest of the film about right so he's got to lose but a lot of people didn't expect that a lot of people were like he's crazy he's gonna go in he's gonna beat this guy up and then we're gonna move on to something else so to see him fall badly right now your audience is intrigued because now they want to see how he's going to get back up so uh i think it is a big question it's a hard question because it's going to be different you know from script to script, depending upon tone and genre and you know, all this other kind of stuff. But I think anytime you can decide to, to shatter the expectation, mm -hmm. then your audience is going to get that much more intrigued. Nice. Upending the expectations. Mm -hmm. So if you follow all of these techniques and, you, and you're making sure you've got a really well-structured story and you're keeping the audience interested, I suspect you'll have a good story, a good screenplay. So what then separates a good story from a great story? What turns something good into timeless? Yeah, that's a good question. And for me, it's about the heart. It's about what's at stake. It's about making sure that when your protagonist wins, I feel like I won. And when your protagonist loses, I feel like I lost. If you can really get me to invest in these characters because that's what people are going to be talking about later they're going to be talking about what those people did or how those people made them feel like if we think about um oh gosh what's the name of this movie <laughs> when i think of it it's going to be like duh you know it's the it's the kids who are in detention all day breakfast club there we go you think about the breakfast club there is absolutely nothing happening for an entire 90 to 100 minutes right like it's it's not one of those goal setting you know here's the action show don't tell no they're just sitting there and talking for like an hour or an hour and a half right but because we get to know them so deeply people are still talking about it now you know so i just think there's something about making your characters relatable and having me invest in whatever their journey is invest in what they want and what they don't want and what they need then I'm going to remember them. I'm going to relate to it because they should be people and not characters, right? They should be real people because I'm a real person and hopefully I have some, some empathy, <laughs> right? Then I'm going to feel connected to them and then they're going to stay with me, you know, from here on out. So infusing that heart and emotion and relatability, that's really what gives it the impact. Yeah, to me, that's kind of the thing that sets it apart. I feel like, you know, you're going to see the same films over and over again. Boy meets girl, you know, boy saves girl from bad guy. Good guy saves the world. But the thing that's going to make you uh, connect to one over the other is being invested in those characters and understanding what they have to lose, what's at stake for them, and wanting to fight with them to not lose it. Now, 
from your experience, what do producers look for in a screenplay? Good question. It's going to depend on the producer. It's going to depend on the studio that they work for. It's going to depend on what they're trying to make. I think at the end of the day, they want something that's high concept. Um, and people are like, well, what does that mean? I understand. You know, I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's jargon. <laughs> you know what I mean? But basically what it means is you can come in and you can sell this world, right? And sell these characters and what they need to accomplish in that world. But again, by heightening it so it isn't as simple as boy meets girl. Like I tell people all the time, uh, Romeo and Juliet in whatever century it was when Shakespeare did it on the stage is different from Romeo and Juliet with Leonardo DiCaprio in whatever city and time they were in. It's different from if I decided to do it in Houston, Texas, if someone decided to do it in Los Angeles, if someone decided to do it in New York, or if it was being done on Mars. So even though it's the same story, the concept gets a little bigger when we start thinking, well, what's Romeo and Juliet look like in space, right? This is a bad example. But, you know, it just kind of shows you we're all telling the same stories. It's just about heightening it so that it becomes this different world that now we're intrigued, even though it's the same thing. Now, that's interesting to me. That, that seems like... Um wrapping sort of the emotional bones and new skin and, and presenting it in a different package, essentially. Yeah, because, I mean, literally, and I tell people all the time, we're all telling the same story. We're all living the same life right now. We're all watching the same news coverage, right? We're all people who, at least for the last almost, uh, let's give it about 70 years, less than 100 years, have been doing the same. I went to elementary school and then I went to middle school and there was a prom and I went to high school and there were a couple of proms and then I went to college, right? So we're all having the same experiences, you know, give or take. The thing that makes my experience different is my trauma. You know what I mean? What I had to go through, what my stakes were. But other than that, we're telling the same story. So it's about you being able to connect to it and heighten it and that's the thing that's going to make it high concept. But at the end of the day, it's all boy meets girl. It's all war. It's all love. It's all freedom. It's all peace. You know, it's all the same story. It's just about you finding those unique things that you can t attach to it to heighten what the story, what the concept is. So I think producers are looking for that because they know you're coming in with the same story. They're listening to pitches every day, all day. They've heard your pitch already. <laughs> Maybe five times that week already. You know, so they're looking for you to do something different with it. And that's it. Now, when you say heighten, um, do you mean raise the stakes or is there more to, to that? Yeah, I think it can mean, I think it can mean several things. I think raising the stakes is, is one of the obvious. Um, but I also think, like I said before, changing the world, taking that same story and putting it in a different time. Like, for example, if uh, I always like to come up with bad examples, um, but <laughs> let's say we're telling okay let's say we're telling a race story right so we're telling a story about black people and white people telling that story in 2019 looks different from 2000 i mean looks different from you know 1960 looks different from 1900 looks different in the united states looks different in haiti looks different in europe so the story is going to heighten depending upon the time period and depending upon the location. Interesting. So you can change the perspective on the same concept even same and get a totally concept. different thing. Right, and get a totally different thing because now you have to take into consideration the time period and what laws exist and what rules exist. Or if you decide, well, I'm going to put it on a different planet, now you get to make up the rules, which means you can heighten it as much as you want. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I think that there are several things that you can think of or um, by, you know, changing, like I said before, about those stereotypes with people, instead of it being um, a black and white story with a white boss and a black maid, what if suddenly it's a black boss and a white maid? Now you're telling a different story. It's still about race. It's still in whatever time. It's still blah, blah, blah. But now the perspective has changed. Now it's a different story. A little bit <laughs> you know what i mean no yeah you, you're kind of addressing the same themes and yet you're putting it in a different package and upending our expectations yeah you're telling it from a different person's point of view what happens if 
you decide to tell that same story, you decide to tell boy meets girl from the child's point of view. Now you get how I met your mother. <laughs> That's pretty cool, actually, just considering the difference taking the same idea and seeing all the different ways you could approach it. And you could have a whole uh, menu of different stories there. Exactly. Exactly. And all of them still come from the same place. Boy meets girl. Or what is, what is the story from the boy's point of view? What is it from the girl? What is it from their, their future children? What is it from their parents? What is it from one of the friends who used to date one of them? Like what? Now you've got different stories to tell, you know? Yeah, that's excellent. I'm going to be uh, listening back on these notes, and <laughs> that's fantastic. So, before we go to a Q and A, are there any any kind of big tips I haven't asked you about, or uh, anything you think is especially important for storytellers to know? Yeah, I don't think you haven't asked me about this, but you definitely touched on it a little bit, and I just think that structure. I think. Not all writers, but a lot of creators who are not necessarily writers don't look at writing like the skill set that it is. And mostly because we're the usually, you know, the underpaid ones who are not in the spotlight. <laughs> you know what I mean? So a lot of people don't really think of writing as a skill set that needs to be honed and studied. And it does, right? Structure is everything. If you are not going to be a writer director, meaning that you're making your own stuff all the time so you can write whatever you want on the page because then you can shoot whatever you want, right? There's no, there's no middleman, no one else to answer to. Your producer is your uncle. You know, you're getting your money from somebody you know. So it doesn't really matter what's on the page. Okay, great. But for the rest of us who have to go into other rooms to pitch to people to get them to sign on to our thing, we have to understand that structure is everything. And in order to be a working writer in Hollywood, a lot of people don't understand that they're contractors. They're just like, like actors, right? I'm in my contract, like if I'm a TV writer, right? I'm in my contract for X amount of time, and then that contract is over, and I'm just hoping that they bring me back for the next season if you get a next season, which means if I only had, um, if I only had, if I only made X amount of dollars while I was writing for that particular show, my contract's up. Where's the rest of my money going to come from? So now, as a writer, I'm looking for other avenues to write, and it's not going to always be my original content that someone's going to want. It may be, you know you're a great writer, here's an idea, go write it. So the more that you know about structure, the more opportunities you have to actually, you know, just be a working writer and make money and be able to take care of yourself and your family, because then you're able to take other people's ideas and bring them to fruition and just make them happen. You know, so I think if nothing else, we have to make sure that writers and other creatives understand that there's a structure here and it matters. And it's going to be different if you're writing for TV versus film. And it's going to be different if you're doing comedy versus drama. And it's going to be different if you're doing a uh, half hour single camera comedy versus half hour multi camera comedy. So it's your job to be out there watching these shows and these movies and reading these scripts and figuring out what that structure is. Like, if you go watch a TV show, every single TV show has a pattern. I mean, some things are down to the minute. At this minute mark in every episode, the big thing happens. You know what I mean? So it's kind of like your job to do that research and give yourself your own schooling, you know, because most writers, most writers didn't go to school to write. It's just a natural thing that we have and we decided this is what we want to do. Some of us did go to school to write, but for the most part, writers come from all walks of life because you get stories from all walks of life, right? If you're just a person who's working at your job every day, you're getting stories every single day <laughs> on your job. Um, so I think it's our, our, it, it's our due diligence to then say, all right, I know this is something I can naturally do, but let me go hone this skill to make sure that I am putting the art first. You know, I'm just, I'm, I'm a purist with that. Like the art has to be more important than selling something. The art has to be more important than seeing my name on the screen. Um, so that's just kind of like my last words of wisdom <laughs> that I have one. No, from. those are some great tips, especially from a purely practical standpoint and having a career in the industry. I mean, that's, that's incredibly helpful. Thank you. Uh, do we want to open it up for some Q&A? Is it okay to bring notes into a pitch meeting? 
can you be a little bit more specific? Do you mean like your own notes to read from, or do you mean notes to give to the executive or the leader? Notes to read from. You know what? Yes. I'm going to say yes, simply because you need to do whatever is going to make you feel comfortable and make sure that you don't miss anything. However, in a pitch meeting, you want to consider yourself an actor. You want to have your script. You want to have it rehearsed well enough so that you can go in and sell this story and sell yourself. A lot of writers are introverts. So for preparation, preparation in that way is usually really good for them so that they don't have to like stop, and look through the notes and figure out where they are because now you're flustered and now you wish you were just at home in front of your you know, computer, right? <laughs> so um, you wanna be as well rehearsed as possible, but if it's gonna make you feel comfortable to have some notes on the side, then definitely do that. I like that drawing a parallel between uh, pitching and being an actor, like yeah. orally presenting the story, acting it out. Yeah, because at the end of the day, if you're not passionate about the story, why should I be? If the way that you talk about the story is, well, this guy went here and then he did that and blah, and I've been listening to people pitch all day versus you coming in saying, it starts on a dark night. You see these two strangers walking. Are they holding hands? We can't tell. Just because of the way you're telling me the story, I'm intrigued. So if you can figure out how to write your pitch like it's a story and then present it in that way, then at least you know they're paying attention. <laughs> you know what I mean? Versus just being bored out of their minds after having heard the same pitch for the 12th time that day, you know? I love that. Yeah. Just making, like you said, the presentation of the story itself, keeping it engaging. Exactly. With everything going on with the WGA, does this hinder new writers gaining access to opportunities? Okay, so these are my thoughts. This is so very new for the people who don't know who might be listening right now. The WGA and the Agents Association, I think it's the ATA, were trying to come to an agreement and they did not, so the WGA said, fire all your agents. And for the most part, from what I know, that's what people are doing. So the question is, is this now going to hinder new writers gaining access? And the, the real answer is we don't know because this is brand new. This is the first time this has kind of happened in, you know, like our present day kind of history. So we're going to be learning as we go along. But I think you could go either, I, I think you could go a few ways. One of them is now you're all on the same playing field because no one has an agent, <laughs> right? So that means when it's time for people to staff shows or look for films, they don't necessarily have the agent as their go-between, which means they can look anywhere to find their writers, right? Because now they don't have to worry about that go-between and now there's no 10% going to this person and no money going onto the packages and blah, blah, blah. They can kind of bring in who they want. So the question is, will they? Or will they just continue to work with people they already know because they don't want to do the work of going to find the new writers? And so that's kind of where I am with it. I think it's either going to open the door because you're now all on the same playing field, or it's gonna close it even harder because those executives and those producers and those showrunners, et cetera, are not gonna to wanna to do the work of going to find where are these other people who I can hire. Now, with that being said, there was a WGA staffing boost uh, hashtag happening on Twitter, and it was awesome. And supposedly showrunners were looking at it and seeing who these writers were who were saying, hey, I'm this kind of writer and this is what I do and blah, blah, blah. And you don't know who may have gotten meetings from that. So we'll see. It's new. We're all trying to figure it out. <laughs> okay. Yolanda says, why do you say treatments aren't needed? So it's not that they aren't needed at all. They just aren't necessary unless they've been requested. Now, with that being said, I say all the time, if whatever works for your process works for your process. So if you need to write a treatment for your own process, by all means, do it. However, because writing a treatment is an exercise in its own, it's basically the prose version of your screenplay. It's beginning, middle, and end, paragraphs and paragraphs and paragraphs, pages and pages and pages of your story. If no one has requested that of you, that means you've put your energy into something that no one may ever see. Whereas you could be putting that energy into actually writing your screenplay, especially because some people try to write the treatment first, 
again, if that works for your process, by all means, do it. If not, then go ahead and write your script. <laughs> put your energy into your script. Put your energy into your pitch. These are the things we know that people are going to see at some point. And if they want a treatment, they'll ask for one. And guess what? If you've already had a thorough outline, and you've already written your script, and that means you know what the story is, beginning, middle, and end, and now writing a treatment isn't a hard thing to do. Now, it doesn't take the, that kind of time and energy. It's just getting it down on paper versus trying to do it somewhere earlier on in the, um, in the process, and you didn't really have any of those answers yet. Now, you've spent months trying to write a treatment, and then nobody ever asked for one. I'm just all about conserving your energy. All right, let's see. You guys have any other questions? How does one go about getting a literary agent when they are ready so they have been ousted as well? Right, so right now what the WGA is saying is that if the agent has not signed on to their agreement, then you can't hire them. Um, there are a lot of boutique agencies that did sign on, so now you would need to look in that area for those agents. Um, and if those bigger agencies ever sign on, then you'll be able to look in their direction for agents. But as far as getting one, this is going to sound crazy, but write, 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 and get great at it, great at it, great at it, so that when you do come in contact with one, because most literary agencies, you cannot submit unsolicited materials. So you can't just send things to them and say, hey, look, I wrote this, be my agent. So you're really waiting on those opportunities to be in the same room with them, whether that's because you won a contest or been a finalist in a contest or sign up for some kind of fellowship or you're at a film festival and you hit it off with someone and they say, hey, send me what you have. So you want to just make sure that when you get that opportunity that whatever you have is ready and that it's more than one thing, right? You don't want to necessarily have been writing one script for the past five years. And then you're like, my script's great. And you send it to your agent and your agent's going to say, well, what else do you have? <laughs> So you want to make sure that you have more stuff that's still in that same genre and still in that same area, right? Not to say that you can't write several different things, but for the most part, when an agent tries to, to book you, uh, they're trying to book you as a particular kind of writer, right? They want to know because shows are like that. So they want to know um, if you're a comedy writer, if you're a family drama person, if you're a cop procedural person, because then they know what shows they can you know, book you on. So kind of right in that same area so they know how to market you. And then once you um, gain your access and people know you a little bit better, then you can say, oh yeah, now I have this other script that I've been working on and it's in this other genre. But because they know you now and they know that you can do what you say you can, now it's not as big of a risk to see the other kind of writing that you do versus they'll look at it. If you come up to them and you've got a sci-fi something, a thriller something, a horror, a drama, a comedy, uh, an animated show, a teen show, they're going to think you have no focus. <laughs> they're going to think you're not really great at, at any of these things if you're putting all of your energy into all of them, right? But if you say, look, I've got these three cop dramas, so they're going to go, we know they can do cop drama and we know they can do drama. So then they can go book you for those shows. And then later on, you can say, well, you know what? I tried my hand at this single camera half a, a, a half hour comedy. And then now they go, oh, well, they usually execute on all the other stuff they write, so let me see how they write this thing. So you kind of want to play that game. So it doesn't mean you can't be multi-talented. It just means find a lane, get great at that thing, and then try to jump in the other one. Okay, do you have any book or resource suggestions for comedy or sci-fi writers? I actually don't. You know, I'm not a book chick. And I say that because just because it's 2019, like, of course, when it was like 2004 and I was straight out of undergrad and everything, then I was reading all of the books, <laughs> you know, but now Google exists and Twitter exists and um, Instagram exists. And you can be following some of these comedy writers and sci-fi writers and they're giving you tips every day. Like YouTube exists. So there's so many places where you can find information. So specifically, um, you know, and you can get specific about what you're looking for in your Google search. Because even now I'm like, well, I don't know. Do you mean books that can teach you how to make jokes? Do you mean books that can teach you about different sci-fi worlds? Like it becomes so convoluted, right? Depending upon what you're looking for. And Google is just a great resource that didn't exist, you know, 30 years ago. And now we have it and I utilize it to the fullest. 
<laughs> so not to say that books are bad because they definitely aren't. I might write one one day. But as of right now, my go-to is let me get specific in my Google search <laughs> and I'll find whatever resources come up from that. And so you might find some books that come up from that. So Shannon, to go off of your point that, you know, all these writers are now available to us all, I'm going to give a plug to the YouTube channel Film Courage. They do some fantastic interviews of a bunch of different writers. Um, I know they have comedy writers and sci-fi writers on there. So um, that's a good place to start too. Yeah, good. I've actually seen a couple of those. I just, I'm really bad at remembering the names of any of the things that I ever, so people are like, hey, could you give me some suggestions? I'm like, there's this thing I watch. <laughs> so bad. Well, there's just so much information everywhere, right? It's just a firehouse of information. There is, but yeah, I, I've seen a couple of the, the things on Film Courage, so you're right. Thank you for remembering that. All right, so Jacqueline said that she would like some more on story theory, so what do you have, Rod? Hmm. All right, a couple of questions. One would be, do you pick out a genre before you start writing? Or do you kind of write and then feel out the genre? Good question. I'm gonna say it's a little bit of both just because I believe in writing in a lane, right? So I believe in mastering something. So for right now, not even for right now, when I was little, I read all of the R.L. Stein books, not Goosebumps. I read Fear Street, <laughs> okay? So ever since, like, so as a teenager, when I was writing prose, writing, uh, doing creative writing, I would always write horror. When I became an adult, it turned into thriller simply because I liked the drama edition. So you don't find a whole lot of horror that gets deep. It's usually just about the kill, <laughs> about the blood, about the... You know, um, so I, I, I live in this thriller drama world. And so because of that, most of my ideas are in there. But I'm just, in, I, yeah, if the idea comes to me and I don't write very much anymore because I spend so much time helping other people write, which is what I want to do. That's what I'm focusing on. That's the lane I've decided. So I'm totally fine with that. But if an idea does come to me, it usually comes to me very, very vividly. And it's like the full screenplay. <laughs> it's like all of it. So then I have to just get it out. And if I can't get it out at that moment, it, it's done. It's gone. Now, I, ha I do have like a little notes, a notepad in my um, uh, phone now. Thank you, technology. So I'm able to kind of like jot down what was, you know, at the top of my mind. And then hopefully I can go back and write it. But yeah, I, I, I decided what genre I live in. And all of my ideas kind of generate there. You know, I, I think I've written one full screenplay that was a rom-com but that's because I was going through a breakup and so that's what was in my you know on my mind and so that's what I wrote <laughs> but beyond that I usually don't kind of live in that world so that makes sense uh, makes sense so you were talking about taking notes um do you have any tips any creativity tips in general for writers I guess yeah I look I'm a people watcher there are so many things happening around you like stories are happening around you, people are happening around you, they have quirks, they have trauma, and just pay attention and write it down. Like that's the great thing about having this notes app that I can just write down anything at any point. And I may never look at it again, or I may look at it one day and go, oh, wow, <laughs> you know, and have this, like this, this big moment. But I just think, um, especially because you should kind of write what you know, right? That at any moment, like even somebody's actual um, argument, like if you've ever been on the other side of the door when someone is arguing, right? And so you're only getting bits and pieces, but you don't have the backstory, so you don't know who's right and who's wrong. If you write down just some of that dialogue and some of that angst that they're feeling, that could open up an entire, you know, storyline. You start to ask yourself, so how did these people get to this place? When I was little, I used to watch people drive by and, like, look in their cars and wonder, like, how did you get here? You know, like, what, what were you doing this morning? <laughs> what got you in your car driving up next to my car at this same time and then I would just start telling I'd have a whole story about it you know so yeah I think you just got to pay attention to the world and know that there's a story around you at all times even if you think my life is mundane there's nothing happening it's like yes something is happening it might not be entertaining I have to tell clients all the time who will say to me but that's how it happened 
But I'm writing a true story, but it's not entertaining. That's why structure for screenplays matter. There have to be stakes. There, have to, there has to be a goal. We have to be invested in the characters. So it doesn't matter if it really happened that way. You got to amp up the drama, <laughs> right? So that it can be entertaining. And I tell people, even if you think about um, reality television, they're not showing you the footage, the 24-hour footage of the people because it's boring. It's not entertaining. They're taking the footage that they have and they're cutting it and they're making a story. <laughs> These people, when they watch it, are just as surprised as you as the footage that was put together to make this thing up. <laughs> you know what I mean? Which is why it's sometimes disjointed. This person had on one outfit in the last scene and now they have this other outfit on in this scene. And that's because they need to take that footage so they can build the story. So the same thing is true, like sure, Every moment in your real life is not entertaining, but that doesn't mean that there aren't stories that can come from it. All right, let's see. If you're asking someone else to help you format your script, is there a standard contract to use to ensure that person doesn't have any future rights to your work? There are lots of contracts out there. Definitely go Google and find one that works best for you. Um, my contract, um, I look at it as an, as an agreement versus a contract. Um, we'll say that you own the work. It's yours, it's not mine. I'm gonna do the work that I'm doing on it. You're gonna pay me my fee and you're gonna go on about your life. It also says though, and this is the part where a lot of people um, are sometimes have pause. It also says that, understand if you're working with someone like this, which is gonna be the same thing for a producer, or same thing for an executive of any kind, they're dealing with ideas on a daily basis. And like I've been saying throughout this podcast today, most of them are not unique. They're hearing the same stuff over and over and over and over again. So as a client, don't assume that just because one of their other clients is working on something similar to yours, that that means that they've taken your work. You know what I mean? Or if that person decides to write something later on, that it means that they've taken your work. So if you want to protect yourself, go get your copyright, do your WGA registration if that's what you want to, and then realize that ideas are floating around. So as long as they're not taking your specific characters and putting them in those specific situations, then you don't know if they were having the same idea, boy meets girl. <laughs> you know what I mean? The difference is your boy met your girl in this place and your boy and your girl are these particular people. But they're still writing a script about boy meets girl. So not everyone has one of these contracts. Some people just expect you to have your copyright and then that should be enough to protect you. Some people do have these contracts. And then in there, it will say basically what I said that it's yours, you own the rights. However, don't try to then come and sue them based on these ideas, these general ideas, these not unique ideas, it definitely says that, right? These general ideas, not unique ideas, to say that they're yours, because what they do for a living is deal with ideas. And then, like I said earlier in the, um, in the podcast, we're all watching the same news, right? We're all kind of living, having the same experiences. And just think about, you know, Black Lives Matter has been a thing for like the past five, six years now, right? So how many movies have been about that? How many TV shows, how many episodes have we seen about cops killing black boys since Black Lives Matter became a thing? And now that Me Too is a thing, how many episodes on TV have we seen about Me Too, right? We don't know what movies are right now getting made that are going to be about Me Too, right? So all, we're having the same experiences. We're dealing with the same ideas. So if you're going to allow someone to read your work, get it copyrighted and just let it be because your work can't get done if it's not gonna get seen you know, by somebody. So, a good question. It's a great point too that ideas are just kind of like generally floating in the zeitgeist. You tend to get a lot of movies at the same time that are about very similar ideas. Yes, did you see, every single time I wanna give this uh, example, I can't remember the names. One is No Strings Attached. Oh, the other is Friends with Benefits. Two movies, same movie came out the same year. One with Ashton Kutcher, one with Justin Timberlake. The same movie. Came out the same year. I was surprised that they both made it. But I always tell people, if 
you have the idea, a thousand other people have that same idea, 100 of them are gonna actually write it, five people are gonna get into the room and two people might sell it. We don't know if, they'll, if either of them will get you know, produced, <laughs> but like you said, like all of the ideas are just in the zeitgeist. We're all having that same experience. I can't tell you how many people have called me and said, I'll have a great idea for a movie. And it's the same thing I heard last week. And these people don't know each other. They've never met each other. They live on opposite sides of the universe. You know what I mean? But it's just, this is what we're experiencing. Well, it, you know, for ideas whose time has come, it's like calculus was invented in two separate places at the exact same time. It's like, that's pretty crazy. Because calculus so, is crazy. <laughs> crazy. What? Do you have any general drama uh, techniques or examples to like heighten suspense or anything around conflict, anything that'll engage the audience from a dramatic perspective? Yes, good, thank you for asking. Don't give it all away. Get into a scene early, and I'm sorry, not early. Get into a scene late and leave early. Don't answer all of the questions. Leave them up to our assumptions. It creates so much tension. Give us some information that your characters don't have. Give them some information that we don't have. <laughs> you know? Like, Ozark does that so very well. Someone will ask a particular question, and the other person will not answer it. Even if we've already seen it happen, it makes us go, well, wait, did it happen like I think it happened? Maybe I'm missing something. Now I'm that much more intrigued. And it heightens the drama. Now I'm like, oh man, what's gonna happen? Simply because they didn't say everything they were thinking, <laughs> you know? And people don't function like that. Like, you know people in your life, in your lives, that will keep things to themselves. They just don't give it all away. And sometimes they're doing that because they're afraid of the judgment that's gonna come on the other side. Sometimes people are pathological liars. Sometimes they just want you to wait for it. <laughs> and they'll give you you know, little bitty breadcrumbs along the way until they're like, dramatically, boom, this was the big secret, right? So that's kind of what you're trying to do. I think in drama, if you give it all to me, and if I'm way ahead of you, now I'm not invested. It's easy to be way ahead of you if you say everything you need. Because now there's no problem to be solved. If I come into the room with my husband and say, why did you cheat on me? And he literally tells me why, the movie's over. You know, like, why? okay, well, roll credits. <laughs> like, why? Why are we still here? Uh, Yolanda, yes, I said enter a scene late and leave early. Meaning, enter the scene in the middle of the conversation. Right when the conversation is getting heated up. So if you want, write the full conversation to the side. Write them walking into the room. Write all the pleasantries they have with each other. Write, the, write as it builds up and builds up to the tense moment right as how they get out of that moment and it falls back down and everybody's good with each other and then cut the beginning and cut the end and just give me the tension. Just give me the, the high point. Don't show me how they got in it and don't show me how they get out of it. Because now I'm high with them, but I didn't drop down. So now when the next scene comes, I'm still up here. And I'm now I'm waiting, give me back, give me, like, go, like, go back. What are they gonna resolve it? What is it, what is it? And then eventually resolve it. Do not set me up and never reveal. Don't set me up and not pay me off. You got to, you have to. But it doesn't have to happen in the same scene. For some things, it doesn't have to happen, have to happen in the same episode. Ah, uh, what's my example? I can't remember what TV show it was, but someone was like dead. Someone very important was dead. And we were going like two or three episodes and like the characters who needed to know didn't know. So that means all the decisions that they're making and blah, 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 they don't know this big thing has happened. Meanwhile, we're at home like, guys, such and such is dead. Someone tell them, someone tell them. Or even this moment right now with, uh, with Jon Snow in Game of Thrones, not knowing that Daenerys is his aunt, is his aunt, but we know. So we keep watching them kiss and watching them have sex and watching them do all these things. And we're at home like, oh my God, someone please tell them, please tell them, please tell them. <laughs> but they don't know, we know. So that creates the tension, that creates the drama. That's why we're here. Okay, let's see. Do you have any suggestions on trade publications writers should know about? Yes, and they're all on social media right now. So good, that's the great thing. You don't even have to buy the weekly magazines anymore like we used to have to, right? But Variety, um, excuse me, Hollywood Reporter, 
deadline. And then there are all sorts of random people like myself who used to do this, but I don't really do it as much. There are all sorts of random people who are also posting <laughs> all of the things that are happening in, um, in, the, uh, in Hollywood right now. Who's buying what, who sold what. But yeah, even if they aren't necessarily putting it directly on their social media, you can go to their websites and they everything that's in the actual trade magazines. Because I do get the magazines now. Um, because of, you know, I had, I had airline points and they were going to like take them away. So they said, here, you can get some magazines. So I was like, great. So now I get, um, entertainment, uh, week. <laughs> but yeah, so entertainment weekly is one of them. So whatever's in the magazine, you can also find online somewhere, but be following them and see what people are buying and see what's, what's getting sold and, and, and kind of ride that way because Hollywood is a trend kind of place. If something did well, everyone's going to want it. Why do you think ABC has a million little things? Because this is us with such a big hit on NBC. <laughs> That's why they added. Okay, in an age where social media is so important, do you think it's important for writers to build awareness of their brand with short films, etc.? Um, this is a hard question because I would like to say no, mostly because uh, Ross and I were talking. We're talking about this earlier. There's so much static on social media <laughs> that it's like everybody's out there, and unless you're gonna have a million followers, and I'm talking about literally 20k followers, you're just lost in the sauce. You know, if you are making short films that are going into these festivals and becoming something great, then yes, you want to tell the world. Um, but as far as just like building your brand as a writer, like I write drama so every day you're putting up some kind of drama something no i mean at the end of the day writers a lot of writers are introverts and a lot of those writers out there who are working writers who are making money every day we don't even know their name we don't even know what they look like i follow a lot of the writers who write for different tv shows and most of them have like three posts <laughs> and guess what they're writing for tv shows so it's not necessary but if okay let me go back because you said writers for me, the answer is no for writers because there's no way to show your writing unless you're showing your writing. Just because you made a short film doesn't mean that has anything to do with your writing because making the film is a collaborative effort. So I don't know if it was the, the, the director who made a choice, the writer who made a choice, the production assistant who made a choice, the cinematographer who made a choice that made me like it. So if you are a, day, if you are a director, then yes, you should have your visual storytelling on this visual media because I can see it and now I get to know what your, what your tone is and what your voice is. But as a writer, I mean, I don't think you should be posting your script every day to say, you know, read my scene, you know, look at what I did. And, and especially because most writers don't even want to send their stuff to people like me who's going to give them feedback. So why would you want to post it randomly on social media? You know, that's just how I look at it. So no, as a writer, I don't think you have to have that kind of brand. But if you are a director, I do think that that's a way to show people how you visually tell stories. So Shannon, where can we find you? What's your website? And do you have any events coming up? Great. Good question. So my website is www.awriterforyourwriter.com. And basically what that means is I am an actual writer. My degrees are in writing. I have written things before. So I understand what it is to be a writer. But because I have my executive background and my production background and my acting background, I also know what that perspective is. So I'm bringing all of those perspectives together to help writers develop their stories. Um, sometimes you will deal with script consultants who have never written a thing in their lives. Sometimes you're, you will deal with executives who haven't written a thing in their lives. And guess what? That's okay. Because they're coming from a different perspective than you as the writer. They have different goals that they have to reach as the executive than you do as the writer. So it's okay that they're not writers. But because I am a writer, I can usually give a note in a way that makes the writers will spin because I understand their language. I speak their language. So my, um, my web address is a writer for your writer com. My email address is info at a writer for your writer com. And on Instagram, I'm the professional pin. And I couldn't get that as my web address because someone stole it. Someone already took it, right? <laughs> on Twitter, I'm my name, Shannon E. Johnson, because someone took the professional pin on Twitter as well. So <laughs> I'm Shannon E. Johnson on Twitter, and my Shannon is spelled with two A's, S-H-A-N-N-A-N, E. Johnson. And then on Instagram, I'm the professional pin. 
Um, so let's see, what do I have coming up? So in May, I am doing a writing intensive. One for people who are writing a feature and one for people who are writing for television. And in five weeks, we're writing a screenplay. We're getting it done. We're getting it out. There are only going to be three people in each class. And your job is going to be to read and write because it's going to be more like a workshop. So that means we're going to, you're going to give your feedback on other people's writing and they're going to give their feedback to you and then you're going to get my feedback on each step of the way. The prerequisite for this is that you have to have a fully fleshed out outline that I have to approve before you get into the class. Because if you don't know where you're going, you're not going to be able to keep up. You just won't. We're going to pass you by and you're going to be making those mistakes. What is happening? You're going to be making, sorry, something came up on my screen. You're going to be making those mistakes of getting lost along the way because you didn't have a plan. So if you don't have your plan, this is not the class for you. Okay, you do have a plan, send me an email, let me look at your outline, and I'll let you know if this is going to be the class for you. But if you know, you're like, look, I don't have a plan. <laughs> I'm nowhere near ready for that. Great, because in June, I've got a class for you. In June, we're going to develop your plan. We're going to go back to this thing about structure. We're going to talk about three-dimensional characters. We're going to talk about creating tangible and intangible goals. We're going to build complications. We're going to heighten states so that you can know how to plan your screenplay so when it's time to write it you can just write and then you'll be ready for the for the writing intent um the deadline for the outline so the the, the um, um class is going to start on may 6th your first act is going to be due on may 3rd so you need to get your outline to me asap so that you can have an opportunity to get act one done by may 3rd um, so there's no actual deadline. It's really just going to be about you. Um, so if you decide not to get approved until May 1st, but you can have an act one done by May 3rd, great. But there are only three people per class. So once they fill up, they fill up. So that's what I have going on. Is that all? I'm on my Texas tour right now. So I'm in Dallas. I did a couple of workshops here. I'm now taking private consultations. I'm going to be in Houston next week, and I'll be doing some private consultations there. I was uh, in Atlanta last week on the Screencraft Writer Summit panel, and then in Houston the week before that, doing a different workshop. So I'm still in Texas, but I think other than that, that's all I have <laughs> coming up. And I'm, I'll probably do some an, another webinar at some other time, so just hang out and follow me on my social media, and you'll know when that comes up. Oh, and for people who are on Facebook, I am on Facebook as a professional fan, so you can find me there as well if that's your jam. I know people like choose what their social media platform is, and they kind of like live there. <laughs> so I, it's totally fine. I'm on Facebook as well. Thanks again to Shannon Johnson for taking the time to be here with us and sharing her knowledge. If you enjoyed the show, please be sure to subscribe and leave a positive review so that we can continue to grow and learn more storytelling tips from our special guests. You can learn more about storytelling and writing lessons at kingo.com. That's K-I-I-N-G-O.com. That's all for today. Now, let's get to work and write some great stories.